So have you messed around with AI at all? Yeah, I use chat GBT uh, for work stuff. Um, you know, it, it, it gives you the bones of something. Uh, it, you know, it's worthless for like a finished product. But, you know, I've been using, I've been using stuff I've already written to write things, the next thing, my entire professional career. And so uh, for me, this is just the same kind of a thing. I just don't have to go back through my records to figure out what's the most relevant uh, press release I wrote last time, or what's the most uh, professional looking agenda I've already written that I can just change, you know, titles and dates on. Um, so I, I, I like it. Uh, the, uh, I have thought about messing around with the art stuff for like graphic design. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, my problem is like, I'm okay with, um, Photoshop and that kind of stuff, but I'm not great. I'm not very artistic. And so when you get these like mangled art pieces out of the art generators, I don't know how to fix it. You know, with the word document, I can fix that, but I have no idea how to fix the, the pictures. So. I have not used that for anything professional yet. <laughs> yeah, we found it kind of handy down here. Uh, last weekend, we ran all the cabs through the chute. And we were getting weights and doing some preconditioning stuff. I plugged all those numbers. Well, I just snapped a picture of all of our cattle papers from the day we had someone taking notes. And, you know, it put everything in order, got all the weights, got all the numbers in order. It took about five minutes. Normally, it takes, yeah. you know, 30 minutes of you know, spreading papers out and did it in like five minutes, just snap photos of everything. So yeah, it, it's, it is kind of handy for stuff like that. Even shoot. Uh, and I mean, it's yeah. just, it's just a, we're just waiting on somebody's imagination to catch up because the technology is getting there. You know, we just got to figure out how best to use it. I mean, right now people are writing bestsellers for Amazon, but <laughs> the, the next thing, I mean, who knows what the actual next thing will be Yeah, and it's only going to get better. Yeah, it, it still makes you work though, doesn't it? It doesn't just spit out a, you know, three hundred page book. It's kind of oh, it will. It just won't be worth the damn. Right, like you, <laughs> you would still have to go through it and edit the thing because it's yeah. going to probably go in circles, or just be a book made up of books that are already written, just on the yeah. subject that you picked. Yeah. Well, and that's I mean the writers' strike out in California. I mean that's their that's their big argue or, you know, position they're trying to get uh, a policy on is that the movie studios can't use AI to start a TV show or a movie script because mm. that's the most work goes into creating the bones of a script, right? I mean, you got to come up with the idea, you have to have, you know, characters, you got to figure everything else. You can pay anybody else to come in and clean it up and make it sound you know punch it up and make it sound funnier or, or uh make it sound more coherent or add a love interest or something like that you can pay people a lot less to just clean up a script and if they could use a computer to start it a bunch of those writers are going to go out of business and so they want to make you know, they want to pass a rule that says, you know, in their contracts, it says that the movie studios can't use AI to generate scripts. And the studios are like, we're not promising that because <laughs> that's that's going to cut huge amounts of times time off of their schedules and they don't have to pay AI to do it. You know, but you can type it into Google and get it done for free. Yeah. Have you heard the deal, Cliff, where people are... Um you know, as opposed to like calling their lawyer and getting billed every six minutes, they'll just type in, you know, kind of like, I have a small LLC. Let me ask chat GPT this legal question. But yeah. It provides, no. you know, to varying degrees of accuracy, you know, answers to your questions. Well, but that was the problem. Did you hear about the lawyer that got arrested? No, I don't. No. No. So, so yeah, there's that, that idea that you can type the questions in and get real answers back. But then uh, somebody 
in the last couple of weeks, a lawyer did that and then just su submitted all of the documentation to the courts, except that mm -hmm. AI had just created case uh, history. Just made some shit up, yeah. Just made shit up. And the guy didn't look it up. He didn't bother to fact check it at all. And so he turned it in. And I guess that's uh, perjury. I don't, I don't, I don't know. It was something, but the lawyer got arrested. Wow. And so, I mean, yeah, I, I think the problem is that there's no way to keep AI honest. You can't threaten it um, and no. you can't constrict it to just wikipedia or, or provable things because there's no way for the ai to know what on the internet is real and what isn't real and it's right. pulling information from everything and so it's it's always going to be maybe <laughs> you know it's, it's kind of like people it can be full yeah. of shit <laughs> yeah but you can arrest people what are you going to do with chat gpt yeah well yeah there's all the put them on the questions way. right yeah <laughs> You can pull somebody's uh, certifications or their license. You can't do that with ChatGPT. <laughs> well, I had something similar happen to me actually. I was at the bank, and I was trying to open another open another business checking account, and there was something wrong with some of the titling. I think I used some third party titling company. Is what happened. So I'm sitting there, and the lady, she's kind of power tripping, and she's like, "You're not going to be able to use this." and this won't work and blah, blah, blah. And you're going to have to get your lawyer to change this and do that. So she left the room to talk to her supervisor. And I started asking Chad GBT some questions. So when she came back, it had given me enough information that I said, hey, um, you know, I texted my lawyer and he said, if you do this and you input this and you do that, it'll actually work. So she's like, OK, sounds good. She thought I really talked to the lawyer. She puts it in. We open the account. And then I told him the next day. Um, I called him just to tell him it worked, and then I, t I, I, I didn't even think of that. Maybe he's pissed at me now, but I told him. I said, yeah, I just chat, you know, typed it into chat GBT and got the answer, and it all worked. He's like, good enough. Yeah. I just say I looked it up online. Yeah. That way you're not, you're not lying. <laughs> counsel. I, I, uh, I reached out to counsel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, that's a good idea. No. Oh. Yep. Brave new world. Brave new world. Doesn't have a lot to do with the horses, though. That is the one thing that AI can't replace. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're not there yet. Yeah. Well, Luckily. I mean, what, what areas could that come into play? I mean, couldn't well, that help I, with record keeping and with some okay. of these things that are like human? Time out, because I'm, I'm going to take the bull by the horns here. Just for everyone listening to this AI nonsense. Uh, this is episode 52 of On The Move, and we've been talking to Cliff Williamson, who is our uh, he is our resident policy expert on all things equine industry. Um, and now you have a pretty esteemed honor. You're the only person to be a three-time guest on the podcast. Woo, man. You guys are lonely. Yeah. <laughs> my pleasure my pleasure it's a great honor great honor to be the first three peak so. yeah yeah so that being said yeah i really want to hear the answer to ben's question so ben go ahead and take the reins but i wanted to kind of set the scene for everybody because otherwise they might be at this point thinking they're listening to the wrong podcast given what we're talking about <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and cliff we are we're desperate very desperate. That's why you're number three. There we go. There we go. I like to hear it. Those are the kind of people I like to keep around. People that are desperate to have me around. <laughs> Spoken yeah, like a true well. politician, Cliff. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you've been listening to all the motivational speakers, it sounds like, and you've positioned yeah, yourself absolutely. to where people absolutely can't live without you. Um, yep. Yeah, it just... Because that, that's the only thing, Cliff, is when you said, well, at least the horse community, you know, the horse world's safe from AI. It, like, that's a great thought. It's easy for me to think, well, this is great. You know, I, I want to do some other things in life, but at least I've got a foot in the horse world where the AI can't take over. But isn't that what they thought? All the white-collar people thought AI would take away the blue-collar jobs and it would be building cars and bridges and all these other things. And now, 
I mean, we just talked about it. There's some great examples where your phone can be your lawyer and he's kind of out of job. So, so when you say that, you're like, Hey, that feels great. Maybe the horse business is safe, but then like, is it, you know, who knows what they could come up with. Right. Well, I, I mean, it, all the record keeping stuff, I think there's a, a lot of that. Uh, you're right. I mean, there are things that are going to mature, evolve, modernize, however you want to say it. But I, my big question is when does, when is there going to be enough information for um, horse racing to be like a programmable game? You know, when are we going to have enough information to where we can figure out, you know, when we can do better than the punters can and we can figure out what the actual odds of a race are going to be with a computer. And, um, and it's, I think there's a lot of factors that go into it. And the thing that I'm most interested in is the one thing that we, we've never been able to number crunch is that visual inspection of what a horse looks like when it's, uh, you know, when riders go up, when, you know, when it walks out to the track, when it does a loop around, you know, we've never, we don't have a, a digital way to quantify that kind of intuitive feeling you get when you see a horse go out on the track. You know, and a lot of, that's what a lot of betters are looking at. They want to see that horse. They want to see if he's, you know, froggy and he's jumping around or if he's down or, you know, whatever. And I, we have all of this new technology in the, in the video space and in the recording space and the analytical side of what that video uh, information can, can reveal. And that'll be, that'll be interesting. And we have people that are already working on that technology for other reasons. You know, there's a whole group in the UK or maybe just the EU in general, that's trying to record horses while they're being ridden to determine whether or not the behavioral char characteristics of that animal are showing that it likes being ridden or doesn't like being ridden. You know, that's a, there's an old kind of technology in the behavioralist space where they just take a picture and, they, you know, there's visual cues, ears up, ears back, you know, head down, head up, tail swishing, all that kind of stuff. But now they're, they're taking it to the next step where they're taking digital photos and they're analyzing shoulder lean or uh, skin tauntness or, you know, whatever, all these other visual cues that a human the eye might not be able to perceive all at once. And, you know, and, and then they're going to decide whether or not that horse likes being ridden to the left or to the right or in a ring or on, you know, in, in sand or on grass or, or uh, in a competition or not in a competition. And that technology would easily be able to translate into, you know, what do we see at the track? Um, and so, I, you know, to your point, it, technology has a lot to offer the space, but it's it's all based on the imagination and the time and willingness to put the effort in of, of somebody that can create this kind of technology. I'm not creating this technology. So <laughs> I know it won't be my problem, but uh, it, it's just a matter of time. So my one thought on that, Cliff, is don't you think the AI would struggle with the same thing that the humans inherently struggle with, that they're not a horse? So, like, for example, like, the best, the people who are the best in the world with working with horses, and they go and they, like, you know, they feel of the horse, they see the horse, all these things, and they might it might be very intuitive for them. But at the same time, they're still not a hundred percent. You know, there's still situations where you're like, well, th this is my best guess about how this horse feels about this situation. And obviously, you can get better and better. And there's some people who are considered master level horsemen, but it's not like the AI will like they aren't a horse so like how will they know the standard of this horse feels good about this or this horse doesn't feel good about this you know that'll only be at, at the same level that humans can understand if a horse feels good about it or a horse doesn't because i'm sure at some point the humans will set this standard right horse well, racing is a little different because it's like a, a set metric but i'm talking about like maybe a more 
um, like a performance horse thing, like a, something that's more judged or like a dressage test or something like that. We used to say that, that technology would only be able to get as far as humanity could take it because mm -hmm. you always had to have a human being that was putting in like the code that said X equals Y, right? But that's where AI is throwing all that out the window because now we have iterative auto generating information. We have the capacity for a computer to create new expectations, to do the own work in establishing what X equals, whether it's Y or Z or a combination. And so then at that point, the, your limit is how much experience you can put into the machine. And that, you know, that's like a human being, right? What's the, the Malcolm, the, yeah, Malcolm Gladwell quote is it takes 10,000 hours to be an expert at something. And if you think about the people who knew the most about a horse, you know, where that, 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 that almost telepathic or sense of what a horse was capable of or what it was willing to do. You know, those guys always had the most hours in the saddle. They always had the most hours on the rail. Um, now imagine if you had a computer that could literally witness in the snap of a finger, every single documented horse in all time. <laughs> and that's where the technology can go. Now, if somebody needs to figure out how to ask the computer the right question, so it would bother to do that kind of homework. But that's where we're at. You know, eventually, like AI, like I said earlier, AI is as stupid as it will ever be today. <laughs> in an hour and a half, it will be significantly better than it was an hour ago. And, and that's, it's weird, man. I mean, it's, and it's one of those things that the parts of our world that are always going to be protected are the parts that you need opposable thumbs for, or the things that we you know you need to be able to get 40 feet away from an extension cord. <laughs> you know, those are the things that we're always going to be able to protect. Yeah. But, um, but a lot of other stuff is going to change. Yeah. No kidding. Well, like Chris, I'm sure you're familiar, but I listened to Michio Kako um, talking recently about these quantum computers that they're working on. And I understood very little of it, but I did get the gist that, you know, you were talking about the 10,000 hours. These quantum computers are going to be able to, you know, computate quantum computations. I mean, just ridiculous amounts of information and they'll be teeny. And so you combine that kind of technology with something like Neuralink or something. And next thing you know, I mean, maybe racing a horse will be done best without a rider. Even well, maybe don't even do it digitally, uh, do it for real. And you have a little box on their head and that's the rider. And then you can figure out horse problems or whatever, like who knows, but it, it's pretty yeah. wild, a little, little frightening, honestly, the whole idea of a quantum computer and then turn that, you know, in whatever direction you want to go for whatever application. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's funny in the mid two thousands, the U S Air Force bought something like 2000 PlayStation twos and linked them all together and created a quantum computer. And so like really all we've done, we've had the technology for, you know, almost a generation. It's just figuring out how to make it small enough so we can carry it in our back pocket, <laughs> you know, and that's going from 2000 PlayStation twos to something that can fit in the back of your car is uh, a huge leap. And so it, it's only going to keep getting better and faster and smarter and smaller. And then that's when you can start putting it in stuff and doing doing something with it. Um, but, you know, like I said, I think I think we've got a little while to worry about that. At least the horse training side will be fun. People yeah. people still want to boarding horses, training horses, selling horses. I think that'll be a safe bet. Yeah. But if anything, so that world will stay more safe as we yeah. go more towards technology because people will value it more. Yeah. But a minute ago, were you talking about pretty much completely augmenting horse racing? 
and all they have to do is figure out just how to kind of simulate an unpredictable horse race, and then people can bet on it, and it's not really even happening at all? I was thinking people would use it to bet on horse races. Oh, okay. I, w- I thought you were talking about just, like, augmenting horse racing, making it just, just you know, a virtual thing. It's not even... Well, that, that, that exists. That, that exists. I mean, that historical horse betting. Do that, right? Yeah. I mean, it, there, there's... There's always there is going to be that push until there's no horse racing left, right? I mean, they're, the animal rights activists, um, you know, industry watchdog groups, uh, developers, you know, prioritize the real estate over the entertainment experience. There's always going to be people that just think that horse racing's in the way, and um, and so you know they're gonna they're they're gonna be the ones that push that kind of alternative option. Um, like I said, you know, historical horse betting uh, or horse racing. Um, you've got lots of simulators and even video games and things like that that try to create that same kind of experience. Um, I don't see that. I think it's different people are into that stuff. I think it's a different audience. Um, I think the people that are into horse racing or rodeo or any of the equine you know entertainment opportunities out there um you know polo is a very different game if you take the horses out right it's just field hockey (laughs) both can exist and both can have an audience but it's a very different game um and so i think the the appetite that we as a civilization have for horse racing is going to be very dependent on whether or not horse racing can kind of evolve and change with the times and and continue to stay relevant and whether or not there's not if there's alternatives i think that's what they'll be they'll just be alternatives as opposed to being a replacement um because it's different you know you go to horse race you know you want to kind of smell the dirt you want to you know you want to kind of be mad about how much sun is out. <laughs> you know, you want that. Yeah. It's, a, it's a comprehensive experience. It's very different going to the track than watching on TV. And if you're into horse betting, you know, it, maybe there are some places or some things in that gray area in between a purely virtual thing and, and actual honest to God horse racing that you can get into. But those people are just looking for something to bet on. You know, the, the horse part of it is just the thing they decided to get overly invested in now that sports betting is legal uh you know you have the same kind of people that have that kind of investment in baseball or football yeah yeah so that was something i actually was talking about this uh with a guy who came over and rode with me the other day um just talking about kind of like the state of uh horse racing in the united states and with Kaylee with her job, uh, they do a lot of advertising through the triple crown series and stuff. Um, so I've been, I've gotten to watch, um, all the triple crown races cause it's been a point for Kaylee to watch all the triple crown races this year. Um, and you know, like people talk about, Oh, horse racing and this controversy and things like that. And it's like, well, it's still like on NBC and the people, you know, being a part of it saying riders up are like significant celebrities or NFL players or, or very like mainstream personalities. It's by no means a, a fringe activity um, compared to like you know, some of the people we've had on here. I've talked about kind of the more fringe rodeo events mm-hmm. you can have at like, you know, local at like rodeos in rural areas. So by no means is horse racing, it seems to me like it would have a very long way to go before it gets phased out from like a humanitarian or not a humanitarian, but like an animal rights situation. Even though there, it seems like every year there's controversy. If you just look at it on paper, it doesn't seem like it's taken a very big hit from the controversy. It's just, there's news goes through the news cycle. And then every year they have the Derby and everyone packs the house and all these celebrities come and it doesn't seem like anyone really bats an eye. So 
Is that is that kind of how it is, or is that just kind of my impression through the TV? So, I think, and I'll again preface this as I always have by saying I'm not speaking on behalf of any organization. This is purely Cliff Williamson's opinion and his idea of what he thinks he's saying. But the you, you got two different aspects. There's multiple audiences engaged in this debate, right? You have casual viewers who are going to feel bad about horses being hurt. Um, you know, they, they love horses. They like watching horses run. They like the, the excitement and the enthusiasm of what a race on TV is. Uh, you know, they, they get wrapped up in the triple crown conversation every year, but those are the only three horse races that they, they watch. Um, th th that audience is a big motivating factor for why NBC keeps putting these races on TV. You know, th those are the people that advertising is, is paid for. Um, that audience does not have a lot of, uh, appetite for horses going down or fatal injuries happening, but they're also not looking for that information. So unless somebody is on TV telling them that there is something going on, they're never going to know. And so those people rarely are they going to be impacted by some long simmering issue, you know, especially if it's an issue that's going on for years or decades, right? Because they're just not that invested in it. Um, and then on either side of those people, you have people who hate horse racing for one reason or another, and you have people who love horse racing blindly. And really these debates about what's going on in racing and how racing is being impacted is a measure of whether or not people from column A are going to column B, you know, and passing through that middle gray area. And so when we talk about that, we have to look at the, the, the horse industry at large and what the dynamic, what the composition of the horse industry looks like. How many new people do we have? How many long old timers do we have? And whether or not we're affecting change at those really entrenched industry you know, bastions of support, um, or if we're scaring off new people, you know, are we, are we creating barriers for new people to come in? And so I would say the way I've seen it, the horse industry, the racing industry right now is being impacted every single year. They have bad publicity. Um, if you remember the Santa Anita situation, that happened a couple of year, two years ago, um, where they had like 30 deaths on the track. They had, they had just huge numbers of horses going down and there were horses that were dying from unrelated racing issues, but then they were getting lumped into these larger conversations about on track injuries and fatalities. And people were trying to pick out what was this and what was that and why this was happening, what this was happening. But, significantly Santa Anita just let that stuff keep going and going and it kept building momentum and getting more and more national attention. And, um, and so it got to huge numbers. You did not see that this year, right? Churchill Downs, they had the 12th horse got hurt and they cut racing altogether, Churchill Downs and moved all of their starts to a completely different track. And that, would not have happened if the colossal shit storm that was Santa Anita hadn't have already occurred and been a kind of a case study for what these racetracks need to do that, you know, Belmont, it, you know, Churchill Downs had 12 fatalities. I think I'm pretty sure Belmont's over 16 and they still had, <laughs> you know, still finished out the triple crown. Right. And so it's, it's still a, case by case issue about whether or not um, these industry leaders are going to take a position, you know, strong stance to defend their uh, consumers, their, their viewers, their participants, you know, everybody has to make a decision about who their priorities are. Um, you know, Churchill Downs, at least by the actions that they've taken, it seems to suggest that they think something's wrong at the track because 
they didn't cancel their starts. They just moved it to a different facility. Um, the, but I say that, you know, I do, I, I mean, I, I see a change is, has happened or occurred. That's what I'm seeing. That said, your perception about what's going on is very valid. If you're, if you are not seeing a change with, you know, your granted third bird racing is not your primary focus, but you know, you're in the horse world, you're on horse Twitter, <laughs> you know, the, the places that the things and the conversations that are going on in our space aren't affecting you. That has merit. You know, <laughs> that it, sure. it, it, you're not, you're not wrong. It's just different angles of, you know, the different perceptions. Um, and so I think the racing industry, you know, it, it's important. I, I mean, I should mention this. I should have mentioned it at the beginning. Um, track fatalities are not significantly are not noticeably up. We're still operating around that one to 1.5 range of fatalities per 1,000 starts. Hmm. Um, you know, we have you know tens of thousands. I don't even know, maybe hundreds of thousands of animals that start a race every year. And you know, and and so when you look, you're, you'll hear about you know 600 or 700 fatalities. But that's across the industry, across the country, across 12 months worth of races. And, you know, 1%, it's different than what we see in, in human athletics these days. But look at the, the science that's gone into human athletics, um, you know, that we would love to replicate in the horse world, but our patients don't talk to us. So we're always going to be kind of trying to chase and catch up. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's all very complicated, but I, I don't think, I don't think we're seeing the racing industry go away. I think there are a lot of pressures on the third road racing industry in particular, uh, because it has the highest profile, but I don't think it's to your point, Joe, I don't think it's going away either. Um, the, the, the issues, you know, Churchill Downs makes enough money that they could just relocate to a different track and, you know, not even miss a week of racing. Uh, if you told, I don't know, the Washington commanders that they could no longer play in Washington, DC, it'd take them a week to figure out where they were going to go. <laughs> you know, it would, you know, if you, it would, it would take, it would take a while for LSU to figure out where they're going to play. Um, yeah. if all of a sudden you said you can't play on campus. And so yeah. I, I think, I think it's, it's still doing okay. Um, you know, that, uh, I think the other part of this whole conversation that we're seeing is what the ramifications of the new regulations are and how the horse racing integrity and safety authority, um, is going to respond to these kinds of things because now this is a hundred percent their show every as of may middle of may anything that happens in third bird racing in particular but racing in general in 27 different uh states is on the shoulders of the horse racing integrity and safety authority and so um they got to figure out why this is happening they got to figure out how to discuss this they need to figure out how to prevent it um and uh and they're you know brand new organizations so it's it's going to be tough for them to kind of weather this storm um but they're in a position they're also in an enviable position where uh the the locations and the business around this industry is very incentivized to keep their consumers their their viewers happy and so they're going to spend a bunch of money on it. You're going to see a bunch of money at Churchill get thrown at trying to fix this problem. Let, let yeah, me hold you up real quick. Um, because as somebody who knows literally nothing about the horse racing industry, I did see a few of those headlines about the deaths. 
um, and saw comments. And actually, a good friend of ours had a long career as a jockey, and I saw her um, defend the racing industry even and kind of say, hey, you guys don't realize what's going on, and it's not all bad. And she, she was trying to bring a level of nuance, you know, to the conversation. But could you talk a little bit about what some of these injuries are or these fatalities and, and what's causing them? And just a little bit about that, because when you say deaths and fatalities, I have no idea even what causes that or just even what that looks like or why just moving to a different track would solve the issue for a particular race. Yeah, sure. So uh, in in horse racing, um, the vast majority of the time that you hear about a, f a fatal incident, it's because of a catastrophic leg injury. And so, um, you know, it, you think about leg injury like the horse put its foot down wrong or there was a hole in the track or something like that. And that's never the case. <laughs> you know, it's the, the, these tracks are not, there's no hole, there's no gopher holes in the track at Churchill Downs. Um, what's happening is, you know, these animals are heavy. <laughs> They're moving fast. They are, uh, jostling for position they're hitting each other they're you know they're moving and shaking right and as they're putting their legs down and pushing off of that kind of pressure there are so many different things that can cause that horse's leg to twist or fold or bend in a direction that it just can't sustain and then that's when you get a fracture you know you hear human athletes it happens to them all the time uh, you know, it, it's the same kind of a thing. And the difference is that if a human athlete goes down with a compound spiral fracture in their femur, yeah, their career might be over, but they're not going to die. Uh, the horse industry is a little different. <laughs> you know, those kinds of injuries are are life changing for an animal that has 13 years to live and your 13 more years to live. And so the kind of cold hearted part of this is there's a business decision that needs to be made. You know, that injury alone is not the reason is not causing that animal to die. That injury is causing that animal to never be able to walk again, which means that the owner has to make a decision about whether or not they're going to, euthanize it or rehab it for the rest of its life. Um, you know, there are other reasons that we have to put horses down when they have an injury like that. And sometimes it's just because there's no safe way to treat that animal. You know, uh, um, anesthetics are complicated in horses, putting a horse, you know, uh, tranquilizing an animal in general is very complicated. Um, and if it's, if you have a 1200 pound animal that's flashing, flailing and screaming and carrying on, uh, sometimes it's just easier to just let that animal go than try to, then he, then to even try to treat it, you know, much less deal with the ramifications of it. And so, but you have, you know, you have issues. Every joint on a horse's leg is under incredible strain, uh, period. <laughs> you know, it's not just when it's running, but especially when it's running and you know so those joints blow out tendons tear you know it's, sometimes those horses can walk off the track um sometimes they just can't and so the reasons that those horses will have a catastrophic leg leg injury like that uh, uh, you know that there's long running conversations about genetics uh you certainly have conversations around training or competition injuries um, undiagnosed issues uh, could certainly lead to an increased stress that leads to a failure, you know, air, air quotes failure. Um, but then we also have, you know, maybe a horse bumps another horse into the rail. You know, you have a 1200 pound animal going six miles an hour, it flips over a rail, it's going to hurt itself. Um, you know, it's, it's, you, you the, the types of things that can cause a fatality are uh, big and complicated, and broad and diverse. Uh, but to boil it all down, you know, leg injuries are a problem in the horse space, in the equine space. 
Um, especially for an animal that doesn't know that it needs to sit on the couch and watch all nine seasons of The Sopranos until it can get back up again. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, how do you tell an animal that size with that kind of an attitude and those, that kind of energy that it needs to not put any weight on that leg for the next six months? Right. And I mean, and everybody that's in the horse business has had to uh, rehab a horse at one point or another in the stall. And even in the best of circumstances, that is uh, a lot for the person and the horse. Um, and so, you know, it, if, when we talk about failures or uh, fatalities, you know, whatever the new word is that seems cleaner than a horse died on the track today. Um, you know, there could be a lot of reasons why. And then we also have, you know, occasionally and very famously, we hear about horses having heart attacks. Uh, you know, we have horses that'll have a, some kind of other organ failure of some kind that doesn't fully express itself until it's running at full speed. And those, you know, that's the same thing. I mean, I, you will, there are stories of horses that just drop dead mid stride, but those are rare. Um, usually it's a leg issue and leg issues are complicated, mm. but the surface, I mean, the, the causes for a leg failure, I mean, you have issues with the surface, uh, sometimes, you know, there's hard spots or soft spots in the track. Uh, sometimes the tracks themselves are just designed poorly that, you know, there is a conversation about whether or not tracks are creating animals that are more susceptible to failure because of the slope of the track or the composition of the track materials. Um, but you know, all of these tracks are designed with very expensive engineers to accomplish of several different things. You know, it's about maintaining a, a density that provides enough cushion for horses without it being too soft that they get their, their feet caught up in the, in the dirt. Um, you know, they need to be able to drain so that if there is rain, it dries out quickly. Um, you know, they need to be able to be drug and, and maintained and interacted with multiple times in a day. You know, there's a there's a lot of demands on the engineering behind these racetracks and sometimes somebody will come up with an idea and it just doesn't work um and i don't know i don't have uh you know evidence to provide of any one particular track that was poorly designed or poorly engineered um, but there's plenty of anecdotal stories about trainers and owners and even entire races that won't go to one track or another because they don't like the way the track is designed. So they're pickier um, than barrel racers. Sounds oh, cool. Billy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of money in this and no offense to the barrel racing community. They are a very important part of our industry, but uh, how many million dollar barrel horses are getting sold in, in one sale every year? Wow. You know, so, Keeneland is a much bigger game than any barrel sale I've ever heard of. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> wow. So in our rapidly softening culture, what's kind of the what's the way out of that? Do you try to keep that kind of from the public eye or do you build better? No, tracks? You're never get away with that. horse genetics that have to come along or does horse racing just fade out eventually because that's something that you really can't do away with? just because of the nature of the sport and just life. I mean, you've got, uh, you got a lot of different answers to that. And I mean, and every other rodeo barrel racer, team penner, uh, you know, cattle worker that you guys ever interview is going to have, you know, very different perspective. All your performance horse folks, the show jumping folks, uh, you know, even your dressage guys are all going to have things that, don't look good and they would prefer that weren't just the first thing that every unaffiliated observer saw um the the horse racing industry is the most visible aspect of our industry you know 85 percent of our industry is recreational but uh nobody knows anything about tr people who go trail riding every month <laughs> everybody seems to know everything about horse racing 
And so you'll never be able to hide it. Uh, in my opinion, my professional opinion would be uh, be upfront, be transparent, and then also make sure everybody sees the things that you're doing to address it. Um, you know, it, it's a work in progress to figure out how to, how to resolve these issues. And the general public needs to see that so people are taking it seriously and they are putting in the hours to try to fix these problems. So even when you have an effort that doesn't solve the problem, at least everybody knows that you're doing something about it. Uh, some people don't like that. Some people want to come out with their base, best face forward kind of a deal. Um, they, they want a perfect veneer before anybody in the outside world sees it. Uh, the problem with that is it takes time. And so then the general public's like, these guys don't care. They're not doing anything. We can't see anything. We haven't heard anything. And the horses are still getting hurt. Jockeys are still getting hurt. You know, that's another big part of this whole conversation that kind of gets lost in the shuffle is every time one of these horses goes down at full speed, there's a 75 pound human on its back that gets <laughs> jettisoned off like a rocket. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, at best case scenario, you know, it's worse if they're still strapped into the SOB when it hits the ground. Right. Yeah. So that, you know, it's one of those deals where there is there as a community, we need to prioritize uh, safety. Um, but, you know, it's hard that you, you're, you're playing a sport on an animal in the outdoor environment. <laughs> you have literally zero control over almost every aspect of this. And then the only way to standardize safety practices is to try to exert some kind of control over the sport that inherently is supposed to be free and wild. That's why people love horses and love horse sports and horse activities is that it's, it's got this kind of uncontrolled perspective to it where anything could happen. And, um, you know, that, that wild kind of nature to it is really important to this, to how we sell it. You, when you look at anything promoting horse racing, it is not a untacked horse standing in the stall eating hay. It is a horse full gallop flying in your imagination as fast as it can with four feet up in the air, just boo around in a circle. Um, and so that's what people are paying to come see, you know, that's what people are trying to do. Um, and so put it, you know, trying to contain that is tough. Um, I think the other part of this whole conversation is making sure that the industry, the people responsible for making change are listening to the right people. And in my mind, that's the people who are actually invested in the sport. You know, it, it's listening to the people that are are entering into the industry, either as an observer or a participant, listening to the people who are already invested in the industry and are, you know, certainly listening to the people who are um, benefiting from the industry, you know, who have a, a reason to see the industry continue to succeed. Uh, I get really disappointed when I see in particular thoroughbred industry, thoroughbred racing industry, uh, prioritize the sentiment or the feelings of people who are actively trying to shut the industry down. Um, and it's, and it's, there's more nuance to who those people are. It's not always, you know, we can't just say that the humane side of the United States is bad. Many of them, many of their policies and many of their efforts are just counterproductive for the industries that we have chosen to go into, right? There, there many of the things the Humane Society are saying and doing are just bad for us as members of this community. But they're not all just, we can't just disregard everything they say just because they don't like us. Um, that said, we don't need to put them at the top of the call sheet either when we're making decisions or developing solutions. Uh, you know, it's the same thing for every other one of those, you know, multiple letter organizations. Um, you know, the, the people that need to be uh, encouraged to participate and engage in finding solutions are the people who actually want to see this continue. 
Um, and, at, and it seems like common sense, but you'd be amazed at how many of these groups are sitting at the table, even when they don't need to be. Yeah. Well, that's something that happens like just in like an individual's life, right? Like you think about all the people that are maybe supporting you, trying to help you along. And then the only opinion you can listen to is like the two or three haters in the back corner that you have. Right. Yep. And if those voices are the loudest, those are the voices that are influencing how you're making, how you're choosing to live your life. So like that, that might just be like a human problem more than an organizational problem. Everybody wants to be liked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. What's interesting, because something else that kind of ties into this, we've been talking about it lately, is how, you know, take, for instance, civilization. Probably we're in the best time ever to be alive in terms of safety and living well and having all the food you want. We were talking about AI, you know. But, um, but now little problems look like such a big deal. And so I'm sure in the horse industry, I mean, I don't know for sure. You probably know, Cliff, but it seems like nowadays is probably one of the best times ever for a horse to live. I mean, they don't die from predation. They're getting good care, medicine and all that. Yet these things like the injuries on the racetrack, I mean, it's really not that bad. And it's such a small number of horses dying that way. Yet because things are so good, that stands out so drastically to the life we're all accustomed to. And I imagine, I mean, from my perspective, I think so. I'd be curious your thoughts, but as things progress forward and things even get, I mean, unless things get really dystopian fast um, in the wrong direction, it seems like things will probably get better, right? And horses' lives will get better. Those things will always just stand out as being a kind of a problem, especially as the next generation comes up. They're not accustomed to seeing death or, heck, they're not even accustomed to seeing a horse. That's kind of weird to them just in general, so... It seems like that's something we'll deal with is things get better. These like common things in life like death, much less death on a racetrack in public where your leg breaks will seem like a big deal. Well, and, and it's, a, it's a huge deal, especially for people that this is their only exposure to the horse world. So if they, if they, if they are only aware of one, two or three races at all, and then they turn on the TV to watch their first race of the year. And the entire conversation is about 12 horses just that just died. And people are going to be like, what the, what in the hell is going on? <laughs> you know, that's, it sounds awful. Um, and, and, and again, that it, we, you know, it's important to remember that 1.3% uh, fatality figure, you know, is it, it's, it's 1%, you know, that's a, you know, standard error figure, but, um, but it is also, you can't forget that it's also 600 some odd horses. You know I mean? That is nobody wants to be a part of a thing where you have hundreds of animals dying from injury. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we know there are alternatives. You know, again, and this is a numbers thing, but there, you know, 85% of the horse industry in the United States is recreational. How many horses do you think die on trails due to injury or snake bite or sunstroke or heart attack or whatever else? I, I guarantee it's more than 600. Yeah. <laughs> I guarantee... That, that more than 600 horses die of injury in a non-professional space. You, I mean, that recreational isn't just trail riding. I say trail riding because it's the most visually accurate thing. But every single human being that is paying to go to a horse show with zero expectation of getting paid on the way back, that's recreational. And how many times do you hear about horses at a horse show that just has a heart attack and dies in the stall? You know, I, my family has been involved with the state 4-H horse show in Virginia my entire life. And the number of times that we had a 12-year-old little girl's horse die in the middle of the night at the 4-H horse show, and then somebody has to figure out how to explain that. <laughs> I mean, it's 
it's not 600, but it's plenty enough that if you extrapolate it to every 4-H show in the entire country, I bet you're getting to 600. <laughs> and so it's one of those deals where uh, the, your perspective, your you, the position that you're sitting in as an observer to this whole debate says so much about what your opinion is going to be and how you internalize this. You know, if we're talking about, you know, especially if you're coming from a, a more traditional agricultural space or even just a, a, an animal space in general, um, you know, 1% loss in any animal operation is a pretty good year. <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. you're, <laughs> that's, that's a pretty good year. And, you know, if you got if you got 100 sheep on the ground and you lose one, uh, you've done something. <laughs> Yeah. You know, um, well, get in the peacock business. That's a, you have a higher loss than that. It's, it, but it's, yeah. but the, the point being that um, we, we shouldn't discount what our detractors are saying because there is a point. It is 600 horses a year. Uh, but we also shouldn't fall into that space of, well, we have to listen to our detractors explicitly. Um, because there's always another perspective and there, there is a different angle to this conversation. Um, and the alternative argument, you know, well, these horses don't need to be running races. They could be going on trail rides or they could be pasture ornaments. You know, that's another, how many horses get struck by lightning every year? I, I, maybe, <laughs> maybe you guys have not had that experience, but for some reason I've had like three lightning strikes on horses in my life. <laughs> and so, you know, it's one of those deals where, shit can as long as they are breathing shit can happen and we need to all of that needs to be taken into account but we have technology and the thoroughbred industry has money if we can figure out ways to make this safer and make it better we should be investing in it um yeah. and without the general pub without the general concern from the public these huge corporations might not be incentivized to spend that money to figure out how to make it safer and it make it safer for everybody, not just the horse, you know, make it safer for the jockey, make it safer for the owners, make it safer for the spectators, for everybody. Well, and here's a point to add to that cliff. Cause I was discussing this with a friend of mine who's currently in vet school at Virginia tech. And he had, uh, he was telling me how his mother had some friends down the street and they all owned horses and she was concerned about the horse racing deal and the fatalities. Um, and he made the point, he was like, do you realize pretty much all of the major progress we've made in equine veterinary capabilities has been through the racing industry? Because, you know, when, when sweet deer fluffy on the back 40 has a one in hundred thousand problem wrong with him, and there's a turnkey solution that your vet knows about and you can you know buy this supplement or you know put on this ointment and fix it nine times out of ten it's because there were very valuable thoroughbred racehorses that were having that problem and so then there was money backing how to figure out the solution to the problem and I think that's one thing, you know, there's not a ton of people, but there are people within the equine industry that are against horse racing. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they really stop to think what good it does for the industry as a whole. Because like I said, they are, they're heads and shoulders above everyone else in terms of the financial capability they can throw around. So all the advances all of that money, you know, it happens in the racing industry and then spreads to everything else. It's thoroughbred racing is 10% of the population and 30% of the annual revenue. Yeah, <laughs> like, that makes sense. It is, it is a huge economic driver. And, you know, and I'll, I'll tell you a, another thing that, that I used to experience, uh, you know, for anybody that's just hearing me on the podcast for the first time. I spent eight years with the American Horse Council in Washington, D.C. And when people Google horse, I think only when they're angry about something, when they Google horse, my phone number used to be the first thing that came up. And um, 
the number of phone calls <laughs> that sounds like my nightmare <laughs> yeah yeah oh yeah <laughs> but the phone calls i would get from people they'd be angry about this or angry about that and oftentimes people were calling me from within a different sector of the horse industry to complain about a sector of the horse industry that they had some perceived slight or insult from and but they did because they didn't have it in their backyard they didn't know anything about it and so if you're if you're i don't know doing uh horseback rides out in montana and all you do is pack people from one side of the state to the other side of the state for the entire season that doesn't have snow on the ground the thoroughbred racing industry does not matter to you at all. <laughs> and it becomes a very easy segment of the industry to dismiss because why do you care? Your horses are grazing every day. You're not watching TV and nobody that you talk to ever cares about a single thoroughbred. Race. You're hundreds and hundreds of miles from the closest thoroughbred track. It, you're, you're just not going to care. And so, and that's the same thing for everything. I'll, I'll say the, the biggest issue I, I used to see in regards to horse people hating on thoroughbreds was within the uh, hunter jumper community, because I think, and again, this is not the official position of anybody that I work for, um, the hunter jumper community sees how much money it costs to play this game. And they see how many people, especially if you're doing it for real and you're going to the going to Wellington, you're going to Ocala, you're going to Tahoe, uh, you're coming to Culpeper, and you you see how many people are doing this, you see how much money gets spent in this, you really start to think that the hunter jumper sector is really driving numbers for the national equine conversation. Um but it's a hundred percent big fish, small pond, <laughs> yeah. you know, that it just isn't, I, you know, not to be, not to be dismissive, but there's probably as much money in the a horsemanship, you know, uh, natural training industry as there is in the hunter jumper space. You don't think about it, but day in and day out, there are more people paying for lessons about how to tie a rope halter than there are actually showing at Ocala or Wellington or anywhere else. And so, you know, it's one of those deals where the horse industry is very diverse, it's very broad, and it's very easy to corner yourself in your little hole um, without knowing about it. I, I, I was guilty of it. I assumed because of how, where I grew up in Central Virginia that everybody knew and respected fox hunting. I just thought that every single human being that ever got on a horse knew everything there was to know about fox hunting. Because how the hell couldn't you? Every single person that I knew growing up fox hunted or at least went to the parties every week. <laughs> Why wouldn't I think that everybody knew about fox hunting? And then, you know, I got out of the state of Virginia and realized that if you're not on the East Coast, you do not know shit about fox hunting. <laughs> yeah. It just doesn't exist. There's no way to know about it. And so the fact that we had, you know, trainers and dealers and horse trailer salesmen and feed companies and veterinarians and every other aspect, farriers, every other aspect of the horse industry that was ex almost exclusively catering to the fox hunting community, uh, that makes sense in Culpeper. It makes no sense in, I don't know, Bend, Oregon. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't happen. Now you want to talk about rodeo. There you go. That, then the, there's the flip side. Uh, not a lot of rodeo going on uh, where I was growing up. A little bit more than some places, I guess, but not a lot. Uh, but then you go four hours south, and that's the only thing they're doing. You know, everybody's barrel racing. Everybody's bucking. Everybody's doing something else. Uh, you know, team penning or something, roping. And so it's a, we are very, very blessed as an industry and as a community to be so diverse. That said, sometimes it does create little nasty echo chambers where 
people will be very quick to say all this thoroughbred news is bad news for the horse industry and then we'd all be better off if they just went away hmm. how much do you think that's an important thing that people try to have some understanding and and are kind to other people in the industry even if they don't do the same thing they do not to say you've got to compromise how you work with horses or something but it is kind of wild we're already a minority if you added all the horse people together and there's a lot of a lot of you know boring going on even if it's just yeah. talk or you know just like you said people thinking they're the shit and everyone else is stupid and I mean, the last thing you need to do, we're talking about all these issues, is to then all divide and then everybody try to handle their own their own PR on their own instead of kind of getting together and trying to represent an entire horse community. And then, you know, you have different, you know, whatever factions broken off of that. It's, it is the worst thing that we can do as an industry is to start trying to put others down to give ourselves a leg up. And that's, and that's what I see all the time is, or I used to see all the time was uh, one sector trying, you know, one discipline trying to blast another discipline just so that they hope the spotlight stays off them. Um, you know, we see that we see it a lot. The second you start, opening doors and, and throwing back the, the window curtains, you get a little sunlight on any of our disciplines and you're going to find some skeletons, you know, Jeez. just, it's just the, the truth of it is there's, That's there's some bad actors everywhere. And so it, it, it is in our best interest to collaborate and, you know, come together as one kind of singular group. Um, and then it's also important to police ourselves. I mean, that's the other thing that, that is, is, frustrating is who is better at finding the bad actors in an equine discipline than other um, equine enthusiasts? <laughs> you know, I, we know what to look for. You know, we, we, we know, you know, we all have lived experiences that we could use to help make these other areas safer, better, more inviting, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, but because it's so easy to just stay in your lane, uh, most horse people don't, don't get out there, you know, uh, <laughs> the Joe, you talking about, you know, this year being a big year for you watching the, the triple crown. It makes me laugh. Uh, there is nothing about the way that you were raised to suggest that you didn't just watch every single triple crown, every single year that you've been alive, your entire life has been in the horse industry. Why yeah. wouldn't the <laughs> why wouldn't the triple crown at the very at the bare minimum be an annual thing that you just had on your calendar? But there's no reason for it to. You know, it's all preferences and based on what you do and what you don't do. And you know, nobody would look at your father as an example and be like, "This guy loves the Kentucky Derby," and he probably yeah. does. <laughs> but you know, yeah. it's just one of those things where but, it's but uh, he loves it for the bourbon, not the horse. Yeah, there you go. It's a good party. It's a good party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but but it's you know it is it, ben to your point it, it's just one of those deals where um we have so much more in common than we have uh different that it should be much easier than it seems to be to all get along um and you know it to to Jez's earlier point about you know, funding research and, you know, and, and engaging in new practices and spreading information. Uh, the, when our sectors come together, we accomplish some incredible things, but when you have, uh, the AQHA doing their thing and the jockey club doing their thing, and there's zero communication between the two, you start to see things get duplicated. You start to see people stepping on each other's toes. You start to see, organizations snaking resources out from underneath of each other, even if they're doing it unwittingly, you know, unknowingly, it's, uh, <laughs> it happens. And so it's, it's really important for there to be that kind of singular focus or center point to all these conversations. Um, and it's tough, you know, 
everybody's got a little different. The horse and horse people look very different depending on what part of the country you're in. So let me ask you this then. And I know you said you worked for the horse council for eight years and that's not necessarily a, a big enough sample size, but in the Cliff Williamson opinion, I know probably disciplines ebb and flow and like, you know, certain, certain times throughout history, this was more popular and this is more popular, but it, is the horse industry, is it kind of cutthroat? Like if the, the hunter jumpers can't succeed, if the rodeo people are succeeding too much, or is it a rising tide lifts all boats? Like if, if horses are up, then horses are up. Or, or is there, I mean, because it, it might make sense, you know, there's a set amount of land, set amount of recreational dollars to be spent. H how does that work just from what you've seen? So our, the limiting resource and the success of the horse industry is the human being. We don't have enough. Our, every year, our biggest shortfall is how many human beings are involved. Right. Um, and so when you start talking about can this succeed if this is if this is also succeeding, um, what we're what you talk about there is, well, no, both things can succeed as long as there are two distinct groups of human beings to make them succeed. Uh, but if you've got the same pool of human beings, then, yeah, there's not going to be enough people to do English and Western pleasure. <laughs> you know, you're just, you just don't have enough. We uh, right now, a huge issue um, is the availability of event space. You know, we don't, we, our, our event spaces, our uh, equestrian centers, our pavilions, coliseums, covered, covered rings, open rings, uh, dressage pitches, hunter jumper courses, all of those things are now also being used for motocross or uh, gymnastics contests or rodeos or monster truck rallies, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, if we had enough people that we could show that more humans are going to show up to this hunter jumper three day event weekend than Bubba's monster truck rally and taffy pull, then that horse show would take precedent. But right now we, we don't necessarily have that. And God forbid you have two equine events in the same town on the same weekend. You're not even gonna have enough, you know, shavings to go between two different events. <laughs> you know, our retailers aren't prepared to cater to that. Uh, that was the big problem when I, that we had when I was growing up. And, you know, Culpeper County has a, had a premier uh, event space in Commonwealth Park, horse show grounds. And, you know, and it was great. They, they could accommodate thousands of participants, you know, over a weekend. But we didn't have thousands of hotel rooms. And so, you know, if people could come to a horse show, and they absolutely did come to the horse show, but... If they couldn't stay, they, they weren't going to stick around for day two, <laughs> you know, and, and then eventually that got fixed. And then ironically, the show kind of went away. And now those hotels are, you know, finding other things to have guests for. And so then when the show does come back, we can't get hotel rooms in the hotels that we justified building because, you know, now there's a farmer's market or a, I don't know airplane show or something else. And so the the biggest problem we have, the biggest, the tightest resource we have is the human beings, be them participants or spectators. And so I, I think, you know, we talk about like which disciplines are growing and which disciplines are receding. Uh, you know, you have some disciplines that are basically gone, like the big lick, Tennessee walking horse stuff. You know, those used to have uh, thousands of people come to spectate at, and now that, you know, they're getting two or three people per class. 
you know, that kind of thing is, is clearly going away. That discipline is going away. Um, in my world, I saw the barrel racing community explode. They figured out how best to host events in local communities. There's a new competition structure in place so that more people are winning prize money. And even if it's not enough to like go pro, it makes you feel better about the gas you spent to get there. And so it's incentivizing recreational participants to stay involved in that sport. Um, you know, but then you've got, you know, rodeo and thoroughbred racing, and standard bread racing are all going down in numbers, but are also increasing their visibility, right? Because now we have digital platforms to stream these, these events on our own terms. We're not just waiting to see if NBC will put our stuff on TV. Um, you know, technology is allowing for uh, our competitors, both human and animal, to have a higher profile. You know, I, I don't know if you guys are on TikTok, but there's a bull on the PBR circuit and the woman that is a part owner in this thing has a complete TikTok series. And every aspect of this ridiculous animal's life is now out there for the world to see on TikTok. And it humanizes the sport. It makes the sport much more accessible because now you're going to root for a thing. You're not just going to see what happens. Um, that said, you know, we also have a lot of other niche sports that are taking off and people are finding opportunities to compete in. You know, who would have thought that uh, equi lacrosse or whatever the hell the horse lacrosse is would be a thing that people talk about? And, you know, there are now silly little podcasters that are coaching, I'm guessing, girls teams. I don't know who plays horse lacrosse, but... You know, it's one of those deals where that's a thing that did not exist 20 years. The sport existed. Nobody cared. <laughs> you know, we have multiple versions of polo now, right? Yeah. I mean, the, you know, there's 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 the XFL of polo that, you know, you could, that some people can go watch somewhere. The, you can have regular polo somewhere or youth polo. And that polo was not a sport that normal people were expected to be able to play. <laughs> that was not a thing that was supposed to be accessible and now you can drive to quiet little towns in rappahannock county virginia and play polo you know yeah, but there's some, some billionaires out there that are really ticked about that, that <laughs> people get to play polo well you know i mean fox hunting fox hunting is you know is supposed to be a, a kingly endeavor and if you come to central virginia you'll see a whole bunch of rednecks getting drunk on horses it's a, it's a very different thing <laughs> and but it but that's what it keeps whole generations of people involved in uh, equestrian sports. And so I, I think there's always going to be ebbs and flows. There's always going to be new sports and new activities that come in. Uh, people are always going to find a way to make something that seems very laid back and low key, some kind of competition. You know, you look at the, look at the people that are traveling the world doing these marathon long distance trail rides, you know, that, yeah, those are competitions, you know, <laughs> people have fundraisers for them. But what is so particularly spectacular about just deciding to ride your horse longer than anybody else will? Um, but, you know, but that that gets people in and it gets people excited and it, and it generates a lot of conversation. And so I think I think right now, if I was trying to bet money, I think there is opportunity to figure out how to gamify rodeo sports better. Um, and if we could figure out a way to be able to bet on rodeo sports in a consistent way, I think you would see our, our rodeo affiliated equestrian sports explode. Um, you know, I, I, I think uh, I've always, I was always a big proponent of the fantasy sports will make any sports discipline more exciting. And so, you know, figuring out how to take, uh, I don't know, an international hunter jumper series and create some kind of fantasy sports betting opportunity 
would be huge and I think would make bring a lot of eyes. It's really hard to say that uh, show jumping round is not exciting. <laughs> you know, it is. Seeing a bunch of horses go jump faster and faster over progressively higher and higher jumps is really, really fun. And if you could put money on it, great. Um, you know, and that's, and so I think there's, I think there are opportunities. I think depending on what part of the country you're in, you're going to see some things that are really growing right now coming out of the pandemic. Um, but I don't know nationally, I don't know that there's any difference in what we've always seen. I think, I think the, the powerhouse entities that exist as far as discipline and breeds are just as strong as they were before because it's an easier or it's a lower barrier to entry. It is very easy to get into a QHA in general. Hmm. You can find a quarter horse somewhere and then you can start going to a QHA shows. Yeah. You know, it, but then, you know, maybe you like the colors a little bit different. So then all of a sudden you're like, well, maybe I'll go try out these paint and nap shows. And all of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden you're going to paint and Appaloosa classes. And those are a lot harder to find, but they're just as fun, right? It's, it, you know, it's it's just a little less convenient to get to, um, you know, and or same thing with Morgans or Arabians or, you know, whatever else. They, they, these people breed communities. These entities breed communities. And um, and they're always just one fad away from being the next big thing. You know, I, I, I don't really remember it, but I, I, I know that I was around for it when the Arabian horse interest kind of like peaked here in the United States. You know, people were spending millions of dollars to fly in bloodlines from the Middle East. And, you know, for what now? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, th there probably are still million dollar Arabians. I absolutely believe it. Um, it's just nobody else cares. And so I, that kind of ebb and flow is always going to be there, I think. Um, but right now, at, if I had to bet money, I'd say if we could figure out how to bet on barrel racing, that'd be the next big thing. What about you? What do you think's next? I, I definitely agree with you on, on people wanting a piece of the action. I mean, in my little teeny part of the world here, uh, talking to my clients even and what they want to do with their horse when they get home, everybody wants to go do something. You know, they, they don't just plan the trail ride. They want to get out there and compete, have some fun. Maybe it's not even about the money. They want to, I think people want to feel like something's at stake. They want to feel kind of important. And I think you're right in the sense that people that maybe don't have a horse or maybe can't ride their horse or whatever, they might want a piece of it um, kind of virtually, have some kind of stake, have a way to be involved in, in the action. Now that you can watch so many of these things that, you used to have to wait for it to get on TV. Yeah, because that's a really good point, Cliff. That kind of blew my mind with that comment. Like with the Cowboy Channel and all these things where you can literally watch like pretty much every rodeo from all the little different organizations, whether it's like a, a state circuit or whatever, but they have them all televised. Um, High school rodeo. Yeah, high school. I mean, well, betting on high school rodeo is a whole different can of Well, yeah, you wouldn't bet on that. Not legally, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, but, you know, it seems to me like you can go and watch, like, the NBA Finals, and there's all these live betting apps and stuff like that. Why couldn't you do the same thing with the NFR? You know, you know the 10 people, and you, you know, you could even have prop bets. Like, if you got 10 bull riders, how many people cover and things like that, like mm -hmm. it seems like there's a huge opportunity there. So maybe we should edit this part out so we can go make our millions and then ride our own. People, horses. There are people that have talked about it. I just haven't seen the finished product come across yet. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's uh, there were some groups when I was still getting to go to the NFR for work every year you'd see people who were trying to venture capitalists and things like that, that were trying to get into the space. Um, and, but it's, it's complicated because the guys that know the industry are not necessarily real excited about a bunch of strangers coming in and trying to cash out. You know, they're, 
we're all a little protective of our business, right? We're, we're protective of our community. <laughs> and so if a bunch of guys that are not dressed appropriately and have a funny accent show up and start talking about, you know, I need exclusive rights to this, that, and the other so that I can digitize it. <laughs> People oh, yeah. are going to be like, no, no, I don't, we, I don't want to do that. <laughs> we've seen Yellowstone Cliff. We know how that goes. <laughs> well, and actually, Yellowstone's a good, a good point. Um, you know, Yellowstone created a huge interest in reigning that did not exist. And reigning, National Reigning Horse Association did a really good job of making sure that Taylor Sheridan had everything he needed to put good horses on TV. And, and then, you know, that they opened themselves up and all of a sudden you started seeing reigning horses get bought by people who were not in the industry for big time money. And, and then the competitions, because this money had been spent on these horses at these sales, the competitions got a lot more important. <laughs> now we needed, we needed to see that this horse that sold for a million dollars, the first horse to sell for a million dollars was worth a million dollars. And, and it, it's fun. It's fun to watch. It's fun to be part of. Um, but then the counter side to that is then all of a sudden, all of these organizations that aren't used to this kind of attention start doing things and making decisions that are going to come back and bite them in the ass. And so it's one of those deals where everybody should get their day in the sun. Every little sector of ours should get their chance to shine. And, you know, it, the general public, who knows what the, what the next thing is that people are going to be into. You know, when, when <laughs> the Olympics come around, the best thing that the horse industry could do is put Snoop Dogg and Kevin Hart in front of the dressage competition and just let them talk about those horses crip walking all day. Because that yeah. clip of Snoop Dogg saying that horse is fucking crip walking is probably the most viewed horse clip of all time. <laughs> you know, I, and I haven't seen that. Oh, uh, you should. It, it was, it was, it was on, it was on national television because it was oh. part. Snoop Dogg and Kevin Hart were doing color commentary for the Olympics, and kept, Snoop Dogg had never seen dressage, and all of a sudden a horse is doing a cross step going across the ring, and Snoop lost his mind. And if the dressage federation had taken ten minutes, they would have flown Snoop Dogg out to a fucking dressage show somewhere and had him do color and commentary for 45 minutes on camera. And it would have been the biggest thing ever. And then all of a sudden everybody in the world would have been going to dressage events. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's just one of those things where we never know where that next thing for us is going to be. Um, and if we all are working together and people think nice things about horse industry and we don't have a lot of infighting or we're not being attacked by outsiders, um, you know, we could be in a position to take advantage of it. Uh, it's just, Sometimes we are, sometimes we aren't. Just keep steady on as she goes, right? Keep doing your 10,000 hours in the meantime. And, you know, uh, there's a lot to be said about the need, <coughs> continued need for youth engagement. You know, it's important that we don't get into a place where lessons cost so much that, you know, a, a nine-year-old can't take a, can't get on a horse. Um, you know, we've got, we've got to make sure that, that we collectively as an industry are also supporting all of the things on the periphery that allow people into our space. You know, lesson barns are really important and honestly, communities need to do more to protect them. Uh, you know, we need to make sure that we can legally keep equine facilities open in our suburban and urban areas. You know, everybody in the horse industry should be doing more to make sure that these guys that are running uh, therapeutic riding centers or lesson facilities or, you know, any of these other kinds of youth programming, um, we need to make sure they got horses. We got to make sure they got help. We got to make sure they got funding. Um, you know, all these things make money. It's just usually they make enough money to stay open. So then, but they don't make enough money to compete with Walmart when they're trying to come in and build a parking lot. 
Um, and so it's, it's one of those things where there's, there's a lot of ways that we can shore up those weaknesses and kind of fi figure out how to keep people interested in, in our, in our business. Um, but it starts with kids. It, according to, gosh, I want to say maybe the outdoor recreation round table. No, youth sports, youth sports affiliate, I think. Um, kids decide what their sport or activity is going to be at 15 and then do not. No, no, I, I lied. I lied at 13. They decide what their thing for life is going to be at 13. Most kids, according to our statistics, don't get into equestrian sports until they're 15. <laughs> so that's a huge problem. <laughs> Is we're trying to find people who have already decided about what their life thing is two years after they'd made that decision. Um, yeah. And so regardless of the money, regardless of the availability, regardless of anything else, we're just attracting a crowd. We're not doing a good enough job of promoting our sport, whether, and, and it could be any aspect of it, but it's, you know, we're, we're, we're aging ourselves out too quickly here. Um, and then you add on top of it, access to horses is very geographical. The financial component of being involved in equine sports is very serious. Um, and then negative PR from things like, you know, 12 horses go down in church at uh, Churchill for over a three week period. Um, it disincentivizes people to get to start with us. It might not run them, scare them off, but it will make it harder for them to come on board. And so, you know, it's one of those deals where uh, we can keep finding new ways to dress up what horse sports look like. You know, my my favorite thing in the world, when I came back from the Peace Corps, um, that was the first time I'd ever seen jousting on TV. There was a reality TV show, and that was the first time I'd ever seen jousting, like competitive jousting. And I thought that was the coolest shit on the planet. And I was unemployed, nothing better to do. I was like, I need to get into jousting. <laughs> that was, I was singularly focused, man. That was all I wanted to do. The only horse thing I wanted to do was go joust. Um, and who knows, it, you know, for some people that might still be the gateway into the horse industry that they needed. Um, and we need to, you know, promote that collectively as a whole equine community. We need to help support that because um, it doesn't need to be a competition just because they're jousting doesn't mean they can't also be into Western pleasure. doesn't mean they can't also be into, you know, pony showmanship. <laughs> you know, they can, every, all of us can do multiple things. Um, but we got to remind ourselves of that sometimes because it gets real easy just to be a one, one trick pony. <laughs> yeah. Amen. I got to ask you, is this uh this must be like therapy for you. Do you get out enough? Are you talking to people and, you know, remaining? I talk to people all day, society? every day. Wow. So you must. Yeah. Uh, That's my job, man. What do you pay for? Yeah. This, I don't this get to talk about like, horses very much. This is probably your best uh, podcast yet with us. I mean, you just <laughs> you just keep coming. It's great. It's really great. So, I don't get to talk about it. horses very much right now. Yeah, I talk I about <laughs> the Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> talk, what a boring uh, subject. Uh, I'm spending a lot of time talking about FFA funding right now. Yeah. Are they still trying to say <laughs> your local they... FFA listeners? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's uh, important for all your listeners to support your local FFA because your state is not going to. As hard as I try, they are not going to. <laughs> oh, man. Yep. Yep. Well, no, but it's, been it's, awesome. it's good. We, we, we've got a bunch of stuff that the state of Virginia has got a lot of stuff going on and, um, and the horse world is, is doing some really cool things out here. And so I've been really lucky that I've gotten to kind of continue some of those conversations as I've transitioned into my new career. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I don't, I don't get to talk about horse stuff very much. So this is a little, a little, uh, cathartic, I guess. Well, we're glad to facilitate that. We'll, uh, we'll send you a bill. Appreciate it. Just to, yeah, a mo yeah, a modest, do it, do a modest it. fee. It's not a, not, nothing much. <laughs> yeah, good, good. <laughs> no, thanks, uh, Cliff. It, it's always really fun, man. This is 
this is stuff I've never thought of, never even heard about half the time. So you're like a, Gosh. you're like taking, you know how you take all these brain supplements? I feel like having a conversation with Cliff Williamson is like taking the best brain supplement when it comes to horses you can take. One shot, one shot dose. Just yeah. take all of it all at once. <laughs> yeah, you start, yeah. start overloading right about at an hour and 30. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, because because to Ben's point, you know, both of us being professionals in the industry, we're probably no better. No, I mean, you get paid to ride horses, Ben? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no. <laughs> yeah. So you're a professional. I mean, I don't know why that was a funny comment. <laughs> I mean, that's how I, I pay the bills. Pretty sure that's how you pay the bills. But what I mean is it's so easy to get blinders on like you're talking about. And you don't you kind of think about what's going on in your little world and don't think about the macro. And that's that that's what this these conversations do for me quite a bit is kind of put everything back into perspective. And um, and, you know, you need that in life in general sometimes because you just you kind of get your head down and you just kind of plow your own little field and like we were talking about earlier all these little book problems become really big problems if you don't keep perspective and then you're like oh okay yeah these are like maybe this is how i should look at things instead of just i don't know the handful of people i talk to each month that Mm -hmm. i'm dealing with you know so it's it's been a really fun conversation man we appreciate you coming on no i appreciate the invitation send me a bill next time ben (laughs) nah we'll send you a big big thank you card but uh great to see you cliff hey thank you all appreciate it it was fun yeah you getting into the bourbon now oh yeah that's i was about to say brown liquor is always appreciated if uh if you're looking for something (laughs) to send ben (laughs) all (laughs) righty Well, before he yeah. shuts it off, I mean, you didn't forget to say anything that you're going to say after we stop recording. That's going to be really great. And we're going to say, shoot, Cliff, you should have said that during the podcast. Save it for number four. We'll save it for number four. <laughs> All right. There you go. <laughs> you always got to keep them, keep them wanting more, Ben. That, that podcast and one-on-one, big man. <laughs> yeah, we should tell him the stats on his podcasts. <laughs> yeah, two. Oh, two. I know my mom listened, so I know you had two. <laughs> there you uh, go. Yeah, I don't think she's registered with um, one of the big companies though, because it doesn't show up. Nope, probably not. The- no, probably not. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. All right, thanks everybody. See you.